Thank you for downloading this podcast from the Forum for Philosophy. Subscribe for weekly discussions of science, culture, politics and the arts from a philosophical perspective. The Forum is a non-profit organisation and our events are free and open to all. You can support our work via our website and Facebook page. Hello and welcome to this Forum for European Philosophy event at the LSE. Uh, my name is Danielle Sands, I'm a fellow at the Forum and I'm going to be chairing this evening's event. So this is our last event of the term, um, but you should know that the programme for summer is up on our website, so do go and have a look at that. Um, so this evening we are thinking and talking about disgust. And we're discussing what William Miller calls the rich universe of the disgusting. So let me introduce our speakers. Tina Chanta is Professor of Philosophy and Gender Studies at Kingston University. Joe Applin is Reader in the History of Art at the Courtauld Institute of Art. And Sophie Russell is Lecturer in Social Psychology at the University of Surrey. So Sophie, perhaps you could start us off. What is disgust? What is disgust? What is not disgusting? So there are so many things around us are disgusting and that's why it is an emotion that is fascinating to both the lay persons and also to researchers alike. I would say the thing that is fascinating about disgust is that we basically want to come close to it but not too close, so to disgusting objects. So um, for instance, we, if we see vomit on the floor, we're often intrigued and we want to look at it, but we don't want to come too close. You can also see it in popular media. So, for instance, um, there are a lot of TV programs that are based on the whole idea of, you know, getting people to eat insects or all these kinds of things. We also see it in political speeches. So people often use that phrase, it's just disgusting. So it's such a powerful emotion and it has a definite kind of facial response. So it's all around us. Um, so it's very much kind of connected to, you know, either kind of snarling, uh, stuff like this. It also has um, a clear verbal display. So as I said before, there's something very powerful of using that phrase, it's disgusting. There's also the kind of um, behavioral response. So disgust is very much tied to uh, avoidance and also to um, thoughts about contagion. So that's why it's a, a very interesting emotion because it's quite powerful. So um, we're interested in basically when people uh, feel disgust and I do a lot of research in terms of understanding what is disgusting versus what is kind of maybe other emotions and we're just using the word disgust as a kind of uh, metaphor for disgust. Mm -hmm. So it seems like there's a kind of tension here that disgust, when we say something is disgusting, we're describing a combination both of repulsion and attraction in some way, or fascination. Yes, definitely. We're fascinated. And it's also, it's, it's so powerful because there's this social community function to disgusting. So I've found a lot of my research that when people say it's disgusting, they feel like that's enough to just say that. Versus if um, somebody says they feel angry towards something, they often feel like they have to give some kind of reason for it. So I feel angry towards uh, climate change because, you know, there's a lot of harm going on. So people very much don't feel like they have to explain their disgust. So that's why it's this really kind of commutative function to disgust. Why do you think that is? Um, I think it's because it's, uh, it's an emotion that's kind of evolved. So we have um, distaste and kind of core disgust, so the core disgust that we feel, for instance, towards you know blood, vomit, all these popular things, but it has kind of melded into kind of the interpersonal and moral realm, and that's kind of something that is debatable, whether these forms of disgust are <coughs> pure disgust something else. <laughs> so you, you began to suggest a list of things that um, we might find disgusting. Is it universal? Is it, is it you know, particular things that disgust everybody? Or is I would, it unique to the individual? Uh, I would say that it's, uh, some things are physically disgusting, and that is fairly universal. So we have certain objects so in all cultures, there's some degree that we're going to try to avoid certain pathogens. So for instance, uh, blood is often universally disgusting, for instance. Um, but there are some things that seem to be socially learned. So for instance, um, it seems like children, they typically learn disgust around the potty training years, and it's something develops that over time. So uh, I would say it's uh, something that gets fine-tuned by the culture within, within where we live. <laughs> 
Thank you. So it seems that disgust has been talked about uh, in lots of different ways by lots of different thinkers. Um, Tina, perhaps you could talk a little bit about um, Kristeva and, and abjection and how that connects to disgust. Yeah, I mean, I was just I was just thinking in response to that question. I think someone like Kristeva would have a slightly different take on whether disgust is universal, just because um, for her, she's reading people like Mary Douglas as well as Lacan and Freud, and she's um, arguing in a way that disgust is contingent and culturally produced, so that it might be a learned response, so that th some things that disgust some cultures might not disgust other cultures. So an example of that might be you know, whether you think it's disgusting to eat insects or not, or something mm -hmm. around that, that mm -hmm. kind of, you know, certain taboos, certain prohibitions that um, actually mm -hmm. are historically produced in some, some way, which um, then, which might seem natural, but aren't mm -hmm. actually natural. So this might be one of those kind of disciplinary differences. In, oh yes, I, I do believe to some degree there is socially learned aspects. Um, that's yeah. why there is such a big range in terms of s certain things that we find disgusting versus not. But I just sometimes question whether there are some basic forms, like we all have certain things that we won't eat, for instance, or we won't be willing to touch a bloody cut. Um, that seems to be a little bit universal. Yeah, I mean, I guess, it, I, I guess theorists like Christ Christopher would say that even taste is culturally learned because you, you're brought up in a in a way that um, familiarizes you with certain uh, mm. tastes and defamiliarizes you with certain other tastes. Mm. Yeah, it's very true. You gave the example of insects. Um, you know, in Western cultures, uh, we often refuse to eat that. But, it, you know, it, for a lot of cultures, it's common practice. Like, t it's estimated that two billion people eat insects, but we don't here. So, yeah. why is that maybe discussed? <laughs> I mean, if there is a sense that some things are universally disgusting, which I think you're kind of suggesting and you're slightly resisting, maybe, Tina, is this a, a biological thing? Is it the fear of contamination? Is there some kind of like evolutionary development of those impulses? Or that, that's what some I, I don't fully agree with it, but that's what some people are, argue that the kind of core disgust is kind of this pathogen avoidance, and it develops into kind of more um, interpersonal and moral realms. Disgust is quite a heady word as well, isn't mm. it? I was trying to think of its cognates, and you know. Um, I was, in fact, I was doing it over lunch, and I discovered whilst doing that um, what I do find disgusting when mm. I'm eating, for instance, rather versus what I find kind of gross or distasteful or unsettling. And I was thinking there are these disgust has this kind of very absolute mm. sense, which can feel um, like you don't have to give a defence of it or an exactly. explanation for yeah. it. There's something. Um, so I don't. I I think that there are lots that are shared, and mm. lots of things. Um, blood and so on, that there does seem to be a fairly general um, reaction to, but I think that there are, um, it is, that there are some deeply subjective moments mm. of kind of mm. um, disgust that gets tied up with fear and, um, mm. okay. and other kinds of sort of complicated uh, reactions to. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, actually, I mean, thinking about it, on the other hand, there is this kind of other register to what Chris Davis is doing, where she does suggest from her kind of psychoanalytic roots that something, something like... Uh, yeah, milk or mm -hmm. that, that, that we do have actually um, in some ways um, resistances or um, kind of uh, likes for things which might not entirely be culturally produced. So yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think it does tip quite quickly into some, um, to questions of the erotic and things that we're deeply drawn to as well. Mm -hmm. You know, things that are disgusting, um, sometimes you can't take your eyes away from mm. it too. Um, and in the same way, I think this idea of, um, there's a very famous artwork um, by Merit Oppenheim, a surrealist sculptor who covered a cup and saucer with gazelle fur. Um, and the idea of this being something you would fill with hot tea and then you would put this kind of damp, warm, mm kind of animal fur to your lips that's both kind of mm. sort of potentially deeply erotic and sensuous or depending who you are very um, distasteful or abject even and I think that um, some of our most powerful aversions um, it's just the other side you know there's a very close um, relationship to actually being deeply drawn to mm. it too. Yeah that's really interesting that kind of fascination repulsion thing that's yeah. going on both in something like Kant's notion of the sublime, but also in the, um, Chris Davis' notion of um, the abject, mm -hmm. that we're drawn precisely to that which we resist at some level. Yeah. So that ambiguity is really important and interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's mm -hmm. also interesting that some things we would be willing to maybe see, but we wouldn't be willing to actually ingest or come too when it comes too close to us, we kind of then right. 
put it away, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think it's Martha Nussbaum that said that discuss is all about putting boundaries so that it doesn't come too close. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and obviously, Christopher takes up that boundary mm -hmm. and stability yeah. thing. And I was just thinking as you were talking about um, um, that that idea of yeah the, 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 bound, the boundary making is really crucial because in some way we separate the world according to what disgusts us and what doesn't disgust us mm -hmm. and, um, what we can tolerate and what, what we can't yeah. tolerate mm -hmm. and which is also fascinating because it's like once something is disgusting it's hard to kind of then kind of retrospectively think oh actually that's not disgusting and to get people to change their mind is actually quite difficult mm -hmm. yeah and that's a really interesting way of putting it because I think when it comes to something around um, like if we accept that disgust is culturally produced in some way and then uh, that it therefore has political implications, mm -hmm. then, um, I mean, you know, people like Sarah Ahmed and other people have done a lot of work around this question of disgust and racism, for example, mm -hmm. and whether it can, whether it, if it is a learned response, if there's a way in which it can be learned, relearned, unlearned, mm -hmm. how it can be unlearned, what that would take. Mm -hmm. I think that's really an important question in some ways, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something about the word that it, is, it does seem to suggest that you can't go any further. It kind of shuts down your limits. You know, that expresses the limit at which yeah. you're willing to tolerate something, doesn't it? Yeah. Which isn't mm -hmm. quite the same as other words that we think are similar to disgusting. I think mm -hmm. that it does, it shuts down mm -hmm. um, further discussion. You know you, you, you know, you don't think you can be talked out of finding something disgusting, I suppose, because, because it's visceral, it's not yep. intellectual in some ways. That's what I was trying mm. to think about earlier. Mm. You know, what do we, how do we think about it? And I'm not sure we really do. I think we know when something's disgusting, and I think we can reason out why we find something um, appalling, or yeah, um, exactly. I don't know, another term. Yeah. yeah, it's got this very strong affective. It does, um, yeah. yeah. Mm. And it even differs. Yeah. Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say that um, there's a sense in which um, that, that, uh, notion of it being something we can't quite get over is yeah. is and, and as you say being very visceral and almost involuntary um, gets really interesting especially around the question of whether it is culturally learned and whether it can be changed and what mm -hmm. that might mean but but as you say it does seem to be this gut reaction so yeah. um, it's it's very it's it, it's as if we imbibe it in our mm -hmm bodily reaction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a word that just kind of serves a function and I think it's not one that we tend to use very much in our daily life and the first time it really was in my world a lot was when um, I have a niece that's really picky about what she eats and she goes that's disgusting she would say like it's a really early word that she learned and I was like well you don't really have another word yet maybe it's um salty oh, you know there must be another word there she's no, absolutely certain and that's you know that was just this like that's disgusting which means it's new to me it's unfamiliar what's this I'm not hungry you know all of these yeah. things would get wrapped up in this very certain sense that something was disgusting understood as this was the point at which this needed to be removed from the site you yeah know? Yeah, it's interesting because like some researchers even question whether the moral disgust, if kids have a sense of what is moral disgust um, oh, from four or five, I think um, it's Paul Bloom, he found that, I can't remember the exact age, but from a very young age that children even begin to say that phrase is disgusting mm -hmm. towards moral things, so you know, people being racist or you know, different kinds of, you know, things that we consider kind of to be moral, that they use that term is disgusting, yeah. which is uh, interesting in itself, which as you, uh, you guys have mentioned, it's just um, fascinating because uh, disgust doesn't seem to have a kind of more careful thought appraisal like it seems to be kind of more object focused versus other emotions like for instance anger is tied to more kind of thinking about justice and the harm that's been caused versus disgust it seems like certain objects are disgusting or not which yeah. mm -hmm. and it's, yeah. it seems like it comes back to this idea of um, disgust as a, a something around something about taste which is its etymology in fact right? that, that it's, aesthet it's aesthetic in some deep way mm -hmm. it's not um, it's not intellectual mm -hmm. although I would argue that actually there's a complicated relationship between affect and <laughs> intellect so ultimately it might have a lot to do with intellect but mm -hmm. um, but which kind of accounts for why um, you know um, colonial age people found different races disgusting for example mm. Yeah, and it's definitely been used a lot throughout history. Like, some of the worst instances of uh, us treating other human beings as not fully human, so dehumanization is tied to disgust. And you can see it a lot through kind of the words that are used. So it seems like when we want to kind of dehumanize social outgroups, that we often use disgust in terms related to so uh, animal words, so you know, calling them rodents or vermin, things like that. So it seems to be very strong, disgust seems to be very strongly tied to dehumanization as well.
exactly yeah is mm. that a way of forming community though do you think sort of us versus them or a way of if everyone can agree Absolutely. is that right yeah exactly. yeah I, I would say so yeah yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. so for instance there's been um some research that showed that like uh people they form very close bonds when they agree on purity norms, which are really strongly tied to discuss. Like even so, so like on social media, for instance, it's been found that people that have similar purity norms are more likely to associate and have stronger bonds and stuff. So mm-hmm. it seems to be yes, that discuss seems to be this kind of thing that we use for division between us and them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's a really seems like that's a really important that the whole question of the impure and the improper and the unclean mm-hmm. and um, as you say the the, dis- the how the distinction is drawn between the pure and the impure mm-hmm. is uh, fundamentally tied to what becomes taboo and what doesn't and mm-hmm. what separates one culture from another and mm-hmm. so on yeah yeah i find that fascinating because it's interesting because when we talk about impure we often talk about kind of bodily acts and stuff like that but some people do believe that there's could be impurities of the mind as well um, and that seems to be something that is culturally learned. I mean this seems to bring us around to the idea of, of the limits of subjectivity and the boundaries of the subject and the the threat of that which is disgusting being a threat to one's sense of self as mm. well as one's sense of mm. community. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, that, 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 um, the kind of instability of the border between subject and object or I and you or you know me and the world is, is exactly one of the things that Christopher's interested in with the notion of the abject and how one forms a sense of the self, what, what it means to be a subject as opposed to an object um, and how that, that border does get is both permeable and ambigu- ambiguous in some sense, but also needs to be reinstated in some way. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, that, that question of the instability of borders, I think is really, really important, yeah. Is there a sense that the, the disgusting object reminds us of that instability, reminds us that we're never kind of the discrete selves that we think we are, and that, that is threatening in some way? Mm-hmm. I think that's exactly right. It's like, that's exactly what Chris is trying to think through, and why, it's, why, why, it, why it is that these states of abjection, which in some ways for her, she marks as um, something that uh, is operative in the early years of in infant, the infant's attempt to separate itself self off from the world in, uh, or, or to you know, understand the borders between what, the me and the not me, but that, that, that state of um, abjection for her recurs in various ways throughout, throughout our, our development and, and hence gets uh, reinstated in um, certain moments, whether they're politically significant like racism or whether they're insignificant like I like this and I don't. It seems like the question of mortality is at play mm-hmm. as well, because so many of the things that we find disgusting are related to death or disintegration. Or yeah, that, that, that's believed to be one category of disgust that we fe- frequently feel disgust when something reminds us of, of our animal nature, so things like sex, death, bodily envelope vi- violations, all those things um, are believed to be kind of a specific category of disgust that kind of falls between kind of core disgust and kind of more interpersonal and social moral disgust. Yeah, again, just to pick up on that briefly, that's for, for Christopher, the corpse is a kind of privileged site of objection. So. Yeah, they, uh, like, uh, some research has found that um, people refuse to kind of be willing to sell their soul for any kind of money, which is interesting. Um, like, that's something that people consider to be an impure act, because uh, I guess uh, sort of things should be classed as sacred. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Joe, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the role that disgust has played in, in art mm-hmm. and the history of art. Sure. I think, I mean, it's a term that's pretty heady and is not necessarily one that we would use sort of in the classroom, in the seminar room. And I think precisely because of the reasons you've said, which is that it it kind of shuts down a conversation in a way that you need to kind of be able to think more um, more broadly or objectively about what that response might be. And it's slightly different when you're looking at works of art that seem to be made or produced with at least one of their salient um, features being to invoke or elicit a sense of disgust or repulsion in the viewer and to think about why that might be and there's been different instances or moments of what we would think of that I suppose in the history of art I mean so you mentioned like the sublime so the idea of a magisterial enormous uh, kind of almost terrifying cliff precipice that you know looks off into a massive kind of crater yeah. for instance what that offers you is an is a very safe experience of what that terror might be so I think that the visual work of art is kind of uniquely placed in a way to give you this kind of moment like reparative or some kind of safe moment in which you could imaginatively <coughs> experience something mm. and there's been other more um 
specific instances where there's been a kind of universal agreement that a work of art is perhaps um, is disgusting and it's produced moral outrage as much as a kind yeah. of visceral response and I think we usually would think of it almost always in terms of viscera in some way that you're seeing the insides on the outsides or something whether that's a 17th century yeah. anatomy um, painting or something that much more explicitly kind of depicts or actually includes bodily fluids and I think that they're the ones that the moment where the moral and the, the kind of the immediate physical reaction come together and that's when you get terrible things like you know artworks getting taken down off walls or um, shows getting shut down because there's been this collective moral mm -hmm. outrage which I think does unite people in quite a powerful mm -hmm. way and there's been instances of of that there was I mean famous ones would be the um, the portrait of Myra Hindley that was made from handprints that was in the big sensation exhibition which was probably 20 years ago now um, uh, this idea you know that this was morally repugnant um, and this was hugely sort of controversial in the same exhibition um, um, Chris Ophelia's <coughs> painting of um, the virgin that was placed on um, the pedestal was made up of elephant dung, mm. you know, so in a way the work yeah. is doing that work for you, it's, it's, it's inviting you to have that conversation or response, but of course what it did was just immediately um, have those works shut down for those reasons, so it kind of stopped conversation in quite powerful ways, and there are moments where I think disgust has been used um, uh, provocatively by an artist, to, you know, to deliberately to elicit that response, which isn't quite the same as um, simply having quite a strong reaction to um, you know, I don't know, an image of a, of, a, of, a, of a corpse, for instance, which might not necessarily exist solely to make you feel disgust. So shock and disgust seem quite closely allied in those examples that you've given? I think they can be, and I think that the least successful works of art, if we can talk in those terms, but are ones that they kind of, their intention seems to be solely to shock. I don't think that's a particularly... Yeah. Um, challenging or exciting or productive encounter to have with a work of art and I think that's something that always needs thinking about like what else is the work doing if it's just there to shock or provoke then you need to ask like I always think one more question about what else we might say about that what other questions it can it can raise but I think that the immediate reaction can be that it's that it's out to shock that's probably a more kind of popular way you'd hear them denigrated in that way so why else might an artist uh, produce something that stimulates disgust what else might be going on in that it's a good question I was thinking trying to think about this kind of more so I'm really kind of specialist in modern and contemporary <coughs> art and the from the 1960s onwards but I was thinking in the kind of longer history of, of art what might constitute a disgusting object and I don't know if this is quite the word we might use but I think if you Consider in the Middle Ages, for instance, in, in a church, you might see a very powerful image of, say, Christ on the cross, for instance. This, um, which can be very visceral, you know, where you can really, you know, it's a very kind of sort of a repulsive, often, of course, at the same time, very beautiful um, sort of rendering of the body. And that would have been part being to elicit, I mean, disgust is a pretty profane term for it, but for potentially a largely illiterate um, church-going congregation that can't engage with, with um, liturgy in a textual form, you would need this visual kind of manifestation to kind of both narrate a story but to elicit a very, very powerful response. And I was thinking um, particularly Northern European kind of um, sort of sculptures that you might see in churches and so on would, I think now, they're quite powerful still when you see them. That can be a very vivid image of like a crown of thorns and so on. And I think that's precisely to elicit a very, um, a very powerful bodily reaction that also, um, I think we could probably put in the same category as some of these other more contemporary works that are um, considered disgusting. There was um, famous works like The Piss Christ that yeah. was... Um, you know, was was morally repugnant, actually, you know, actually disgusting to many people. And again, these, um, I think, when religion comes into the mix, it immediately, um, you know, the moral as well as the kind of visceral um, yeah. pr produce a really powerful um, reaction. And that's a really interesting example that the um, sort of depictions of Christ and so on. I, I was thinking when you asked the question to shift it into a kind of more literary register that. Um, a play like Sarah Kane's Blasted is an interesting example because, you know, it sort of starts with Ian saying, um, I've shat in better places, and he's immediately putting this kind of 
uh, the, the image of shitting in this hotel, this expensive ho or you know ho hotel environment where it doesn't really fit. But the point, the purpose of doing that in some way is on the part of, of uh, Sarah Kane is to force us in this very extreme way to confront things that we, sh we prefer not to confront, you know, rape and, and shit and cannibalism and infantis infanticide, as if they don't actually have anything to do with us. But she's kind of saying, well, in a, in a way they do have something to do with us, and we've got to think them through. And so there's <coughs> obviously a political reason for saying you can't separate yourself from this, even if you want to, and mm -hmm. pretend that you're part of this decent society that this has nothing to do with. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's kind of an interesting way, which is, as you say, it's not just to shock you, it's to make a political point as well. Mm -hmm. And things that we repress or have consistently repressed and cleaned up over, say, the 20th century, and I think mm -hmm. um, I saw someone speaking not so long ago about Victorian mourning objects and the thought that you would wear a, um, not just a locket containing hair but perhaps a brooch, you know, with those hairs coming off very close to your face so that you would feel close to your lost one to photograph... Um, you know, to pose um, your dead um, child as if they were sleeping and this would be with the memento and so on. So these were like really beautiful, really touching. Also absolutely, um, I don't know if disgusting, we have a pretty strong reaction to that kind of thing now where I think life and death kind of rubbed along in a much more kind of um, um, quotidian manner and I think that the further those, the, the gap between them, the cleaner that divide, the more... Um, the more um, maybe shocking it is now, and I remember thinking this just, you know, just from the Victorian engagement with death and our own. Now there's been there's a massive gulf, and wearing, you know, a hairy brooch of your recently deceased, um, you know, wife seems a pretty um, surprising thing to to imagine now. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because it comes back to this idea about ambiguity that yeah. actually disturbs us in some way. If it's not easy, easily categorizable. Yeah. It actually disturbs our nice, neat little boxes that we like to mm -hmm. put everything in. Mm -hmm. Again, there seems to be a bit of a tension between disgust as something which initiates the kind of distancing and retreat. Um, maybe we don't think, maybe we, um, we block off ourselves from those things which are dangerous or disturbing, and what you're saying, Tina, which is that actually there are moments in which disgust invites us to think invites us to, so, yeah. to bring out into the open the things that have been concealed in different ways. Yeah, and I think definitely in, in, in something like, um, yeah, Sarah Kane's Blasted, or to take a very different example, something like Sophocles' Antigone, where, you know, the, mm -hmm. the put putrefaction of the corpse is at the centre stage, although it's off stage in some way, mm -hmm. or not even on stage at all. Mm -hmm. um, but, but also the, uh, the ambiguity, this kind of ambiguous role that someone like, Antigone as a, a child of incest um, represents that she messes with the categories. She's, you know, she sort of represents this this uh, figure that um, is a threat to the very stability of society, at least as far as Creon is con concerned, because she, because of who she is and her very identity, mixes up the categories, but also because of what she's trying to do and how she how she um, refuses to mm -hmm. accept the word of uh, Creon. Mm -hmm. and, and insists on trying to bury her brother, who's a traitor. Anyway, so that whole play, in some ways, it, it, it has a lot to do with, I think, contamination and borders and crossing borders and what it means mm -hmm. for Antigone to even exist in some way. As a woman as, as well, woman, right, exactly, which is like the, the feminine and the masculine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. And the role of the different senses as well, because we keep coming back to where disgust appears or doesn't appear, and you're saying, you know, that the body's off, off stage. Uh, but disgust seems to be more about smell or taste or touch it's than just it really does seem to be about the visual or the oral. In relationship to that play, of course, because that's exactly, that's one of the things that is, is made manifest by, by the, the play, that there's this stench yeah. and, and the wind carries it. And, mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 is, it is very much approached as an object that can't be tolerated in, in some way. Mm -hmm. because of the sense, yeah, as you say, b through the senses as much as, more than, because it's not something which, uh, which there's any visual, uh, we don't mm -hmm. see what's, what's going on, it's all, all that, all the, the attempt to bury the body is off, is off yeah. the stage. Yeah, well. and it makes me think that we think of the, the visual um, as not sensory in the same way as the other senses, that the visual is the, you know, the vehicle to philosophizing in some sense, whereas touch and taste are kind of mm. mortal and bodily and, mm. you know, link us to the animals, I suppose. Mm. 
I was wondering about hearing as well, thinking about mm. the different senses. Can, does, can something sound... I think yeah, we can say something yeah. sounds dis, disgusting too, but I think that's more like... Um, I don't know if we mean that kind of viscerally. It's just the different... Mm. You were talking about this, different ways in which we use the word disgusting, mm. you know. We'd say that sounds disgusting, but like literally mm. what the sounds of... Mm. Of, of that, di- what that yeah. might be is it's not quite the s- yeah. <laughs> not quite the same. Although my mind's now racing. But <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because when people elicit disgust in the lab, per se, a lot of it relies on kind of sensory things in terms of you know making you touch disgusting things or making you watch videos. Um, but actually, probably the weakest evidence it, evidence is hearing things that are disgusting. So I know I can only think of one successful experiment that's elicited disgust through like making you listen listen to like vomit somebody vomiting things like that so um yeah so it's, uh, it's fascinating that maybe there are certain vehicles that are more powerful to elicit discuss certain mm-hmm. senses <laughs> perhaps we could come come back to the the distinction between kind of the physical sense of disgust that we're beginning with and this moral disgust which keeps popping up i mean are these two things that we can um separate effectively or are they so tangled up in you know cultural norms and our sense of who we are and I think with the work of art in particular it's it's really important to be able to do that when the result of the two collapsing means things that censorship right so that would be the problem when a kind of a moral um a claims of moral impurity about an artwork meets the kind of maybe a visceral disgust and that leads to something like censorship or claims that the work is somehow immoral I think that that's you know that's when you do need to disentangle them and have mm-hmm. a conversation about what those two are but I think that the, the you know there's been a number of works about that deliberately they exploit that that tension in order to make a particular point a particularly political point and I think that that's um sometimes some of the most challenging works to actually um to exhibit and to talk about and I think that you know in the press and so on get the hardest time but I think that it's um, it is when the two come together, the moral and the visceral. Um, I think that's the the <coughs> most powerful moment in which a work can get shut down or conversation mm-hmm. can um, can take a very particular reaction return, maybe. Mm-hmm. And obviously, that's I completely agree with you that the question of censorship makes it important to disentangle the two. But mm-hmm. on the other hand, I would say that, in a sense, one doesn't want to distang- disentangle them too much because... If, if, if you're convinced, as I am, that there's a sense in which disgust is bound up with cultural prohibition, mm. and if we understand that d- to be disgusted by um, someone because of their race or age or disability or some other category like that is problematic, mm-hmm. then, we, then we, want to, we want to kind of say that there's a sense in which um, moral disgust is, is really bound up with a kind of physical mm. distaste. I mean, if you think mm-hmm. of something like um, Archimedes, um, d- really nice discussion I think of um, that moment that Audrey Lord talks about in um, one of her one of her narratives where as a as a child of six she finds herself on a train and she realizes that the woman who's sitting next to her is pulling away from her because she doesn't want to touch her and as a six-year-old she doesn't have a way of understanding that so she kind of hallucinates oh there must be a cockroach between me and her because why else would she find me disgusting mm. because she hasn't actually processed the fact that mm. it's her race that she's pulling away for so from so in those kinds of examples and mm-hmm. and I was thinking um you know earlier when <coughs> uh, you were talking about uh, how that the it, the when bodily entrails are, are become visible we yeah. tend to find that uh, disgusting. I was thinking about passage in Clarice Lispector where she talks about the, the cockroach and um, the, the, the sort of uh, insides of the cockroach uh, coming out and how she finds it disgusting and how she tries to reason with herself and she can't get over it. Uh, she, can't, she can't reason with herself. So, yeah, it's a really interesting line. That yeah, yeah. Yeah, I find that that a very interesting to be a very interesting example that you were saying about the train because it makes me wonder sometimes if when we get into this interpersonal moral realm if there is a little bit of a moral question of whether we should be thinking about what is the distinction between physical disgust and moral disgust because if it is related to you know prejudice in some ways could we maybe think of you know how moral disgust might be strongly tied to anger and other emotions in these instances and it is something that's socially large so maybe if you know, a mum shows a lot of disgust to their child, you know, when they're around somebody of a different race. Maybe they have taught that to their child, but they don't, the child doesn't really feel the actual visceral response. So maybe we should, you know, if we recognise that that might not be true disgust, but maybe just more of the kind of social function of disgust that unfortunately sometimes gets learned. Well, may, I mean, as, as you were talking, I was thinking of that famous passage in Fanon, you know, the look a Negro passage where a child finds finds a sort of 
is, is afraid of a, a man just because of the colour of his skin, and that, that does seem to be a totally culturally learned emotion. That, that, um, so, so maybe social disgust is unfortunately all too real and visceral at the same time. And I think things can take on a, a different um, tenor at different moments that can be quite specific, you know, historically or politically significant. And there was a moment in the 1990s where a generation of artists, particularly in New York, um, certainly in the United States, began to make works that were very much about um, the idea of contamination or the heart <coughs> object, the idea of right. the body um, leaking or mm. porous and mm. and so on that was that was kind of dubbed for a period abject art yeah. and it was coming from a very kind of academic um, kind of understanding which was absolutely bringing Chris Davis ideas to yeah. not just narrate the contemporary moment but to actually look to a slightly longer history of modern art that had similarly engaged with both abs in abstract terms and figurative terms ways in which we might feel somehow um, disquiet through yeah. to full-on disgust and in a way this was about rethinking the history of modern art the, rethinking yeah. the history of modernism but it was really a, a response in part to you know the burgeoning age crisis at that time mm -hmm. when you know so yes blood might have a somewhat universal sense of um of abjection but at this moment this absolute idea of bodily secretions um, as being an utter threat yeah. before it was properly understood. And so there's this very powerful and charged kind of moment where thinking about the body and all its leaky, porous, uh, erotic, violent um, um, forms was deeply, <coughs> deeply political and challenging. And it yeah. was meant to be as such, I think, both for artists to be able to express this, but also to challenge an audience to, uh, to confront Mm. Yeah. to confront that as well, which was a powerful way of this sort of idea of contamination and breaching borders. Absolutely, and if you think of someone like someone like um, Mona Hatoum, who, I'm forgetting the name of the artwork now, I'm sure you know it, the, 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 the one where she is um, um, uses a, a camera which... Oh, um, Coy Etranger. Yeah, yeah, yes, that's it, yeah, Coy yeah, Etranger, um, where she, uh, so she's kind of showing the inside of the body in a way that one doesn't usually, isn't mm -hmm. usually confronted with, yes. um, and kind of, again, forcing the viewer to, to confront this somewhat, mm -hmm. this, the, bo the, bo the border that's not, not actually, so, so that, you know, the way we might find the inside of the body disgusting and mm -hmm. we're, we're um, confronted with it in a way that makes mm -hmm. us uncomfortable. So she's playing with that border of the yeah. inside and the outside in, I think, really interesting ways. Absolutely, and the idea of the, the, the naked or exposed female body, which, you know, sounds a bit titillating, and then you yeah. walk into this sort of circular room and actually what you're seeing are the naked insides of her body as she's as the right. camera works its way down and the pulsing of the you hear the sound yeah. so yeah that's right yeah yeah i mean presumably the, the issue of the sex body is, is significant here that historically female bodies have been regarded as more disgusting because they're more leaky they're more kind of porous the boundaries are less clearly defined yeah it seems to be the case that a lot of people feel disgusted by what like a triad or so to do with menstruation pregnancy and um breastfeeding they seem to be kind of the trio that causes a lot of people to feel disgust because it has that kind of core element but as also the sexual image uh, which Alyssa's discussed for a lot of people. Well that seems to be tied into dependency as well, the <coughs> sense of the, the borders between bodies, that the, the sense of birth and pregnancy is, is a sense of our you know initial dependency and, and therefore vulnerability. Yeah. 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 And going back to the animal nature aspect as well. Right, yeah. right, absolutely. Yeah. Can disgust be useful at all? I mean we're talking about it here with <coughs> something that's you know very physical, very instinctive or learned but generally learned in a in a negative way that I think that most of the examples we're talking about are kind of examples of learned disgust which have negative consequences mm -hmm. is it can it be useful can we put it to work in some way yeah I mean I, I, th I think I think if we take the the political valence of disgust seriously I think I think I would I would say that it can be useful in some sense precisely if you go back to your examples of the the, the those sort of deliberately abject uh, work, mm. works of art. They were they were done in order to provoke people, but yeah. in a in a way that people needed to be provoked, right. right? So um, th th there is there is a, a way in which uh, I think you can play with with uh, what we're used to conventionally accepting and what we're not used to convention conventionally accepting and uh, and forcing um, forcing people to uh, confront why mm. what is it about this that we find that we find intolerable or unacceptable uh, mm -hmm. and maybe around that um, finding a way of, uh, of making people reflect on uh, how they might rethink that in mm -hmm. some way. Definitely. Like a, the thing that comes to mind is that a lot of people 
disagree in terms of uh, sexual attitudes and you know if people have different fetishes, etc. But if you if people recognize that maybe they might feel disgusted the idea of you know maybe somebody being into a different pref uh, fetish, but recognize that it's a preference and it, it's just the disgust that they're feeling at the idea, mm -hmm. rather than thinking of it in terms of moral disgust, for instance. Yeah, there's a question of decorum as well. So I think in terms of the the, the sexed or erotic body or just kind of the lived messy realities of the body as well. There's certain forms of decorum and behaviour that are expected. And there was a, um, and so artists that have explicitly challenged that do so, I think, to kind of um, political ends as well. So around this moment of the abject art, um, you know, it wasn't a group, but this kind of label that was used, there was um, um, Ginny and Antoni would get massive, like minimalist cubes of uh, chocolate. So it looked like a minimalist 1960s kind of abstract geometric work of art. But what she would do is gnaw at it. So you can imagine this would be really, I mean, sort of sense all how delicious, but very painful and visceral. So you can see the, the gnaw marks. So she just kind of, like the time, the duration of this work is she physically worked her body to kind of like gouge away at this with her mouth. So it's like, you know, in terms of decorum, that's a pretty kind of disgusting behaviour for, you know, for a woman to undertake. It's also deeply personal. It's about you know, consumption and shame and and Body excess, image. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But what you see is the kind of remainder of this work. And I think this is in part of a tradition of other, often women artists that have really, um, from the 70s, largely in the 70s, would um, engage explicitly with um, the theme of, say, menstruation. So this, this idea of making the insides outside or viscera, right, right. but actually kind of engaging with this. And I yeah. think... Um, something like the Carolee Schneeman um, interior scroll. So she actually just died a couple of weeks ago. Amazing, um, pioneering feminist performance artist and painter who very famously in 1975 um, read aloud from her own book, Cezanne, She Was a Great Painter, before standing naked on a table and pulling from her vagina a scroll um, where she read um, a list of her encounters with various other filmmakers and so on right. and so it's this very iconic image of her sort of mm. pulling this from inside herself um, but actually it was a whole performance but this was also absolutely about the kind of ad addressing the taboo of yeah. of the body's interior that, particularly do we, have that? Yes. we do i bought some disgusting <laughs> images for you there she is at top left yes yeah, so this is a photograph from that performance there yeah yeah and i was also thinking of judy chicago's dinner party which of course is this sort of you know, representation of female genitalia in the form of food in some, some way, and that was banned for, yeah. well, you know, people just couldn't tolerate it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's too much, to, right? Yeah, it's fine to represent a woman who's naked and supine on a couch if you're a guy, but it's not fine if a feminist does it and, you know, crosses some boundaries, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there maybe some links between disgust and shame? Yeah, yeah. I think <coughs> maybe shame is more to, you know, the self kind of self-reflection of disgust and mm -hmm. disgust is kind of more objection to kind of things that other people are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like shame is maybe kind of an internalisation of disgust yes. in some mm -hmm. way, yeah. So it's a moment of identification or projection that happens there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. And that moment for you to have such a strong reaction, mm -hmm. you've got to be reacting to yeah. something that isn't just what's this. There's yeah. some spark of recognition or understanding there that can kind of trigger those kinds mm -hmm. of embarrassment and shame, I think. Mm -hmm. Embarrassment, definitely, I think. There's moments where the disgusting can kind of be funny too. I was thinking, mm -hmm. you know, it's not always, you say there's other, how else can we think about it? Is it, mm -hmm. you know, maybe reparative or redemptive in some way? You know, once it's out there in a kind of completely desublimated manner, well, I guess you have to just deal with this in some ways. And I think, you know, sometimes like the visual arts or literary, you know, the creative arts can kind of permit that sort of sort of mm -hmm. space to, to do that. It's like a transgressive um, way of, of dealing with that thing that we might feel shame about. Yeah. And I suppose you could also say that often humour is used as a way to de defuse yeah. the, the that's abject right. or the that's disgusting because right. we're so uncomfortable with it, we don't know what to do with it, so we just laugh yeah. and find yeah. it funny and oh. dismiss it. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's fascinating. Then when There's this uh, term called moral dumbfounding, and it's been found that when you ask people you know, why something's wrong, that they often say it's disgusting, and they giggle and stuff like that. Yeah, and it's because yeah. that's all they can do. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They can't come up with a reason, so they giggle and say it's disgusting. Mm -hmm. We seem to keep coming back to this idea of excess as well. It's not just that something disgusting is bad. Sometimes something disgusting is too much of a good thing. Mm. That there's some sense of, of something disproportionate or something mm -hmm. unwarranted. It seems like disgust is tied to like gluttony and kind of not showing enough self-restraint. Res 
I think there is this uh, this idea of excess. So I guess the big chocolate minimalist cubes, in a way, yeah. exemplify this. Is you could never eat all of that. It's poor, you know the small mouth marks are paltry compared to the thing that you're actually kind of <coughs> sort of attempting to consume. But I think there's an excess of um, of this kind of too muchness. I think, can I, you put on the next one? It was just, I wanted to quickly show you this. Um, so at the top left is an example of this kind of abject art from the 90s by Kiki Smith. But I wanted to show you this work with this brilliant young um, Scottish artist, Rachel McLean, who's working now. And she works on the edge of the cute and the disgusting. I mean, deliberately, she... she um, uses this very high definition she uses lots of emojis lots of kind of like very culturally familiar images and this very bright kind of acid bright colors and language and she'll have these very over the top cartoonish characters but you know articulating some of the most disgusting and foul thoughts that one might have and she literally mouths along at moments so here she's this is her in the pink wig and she's mouthing along to Kenneth Clark's civilization which is talking about the different forms of beauty that the female body would articulate <coughs> while threatening these young women who starve themselves over the course of the film and the winner at the end of each kind of photo shoot gets to eat one slice of sausage which kind of comes up in this big phallic I mean it's funny and um, sort of form and then it kind of gets hacked off and it's kind of like a smiley face you know like those kind of processed meats and then you get to eat one piece of this kind of sausage while everyone else watches on so it's funny it's disgusting I mean it's truly disgusting it's hard to watch but it's also utterly seductive it's shown in a yeah. In a, you know, on a cinema screen, you know, this is like high definition in every way, and there's something completely excessive mm. about everything, from the fact she plays all the characters to the the, the, the level of costume and detail, but the sheer vivid colour as well as the content, and she deliberately makes it jarring. So mm. this excess is is um, is viscid throughout them. That's really interesting. I was thinking about, in, again, to shift it to the literary again mm. um, for a second, I was thinking about, as you were talking about Emma Glass's uh, re fairly recent novel, Peach, which also is very excessive in certain ways, but and also invokes uh, this kind of magical realist way, the disgust of um, uh, what happens when um, the uh, protagonist is raped, but also turns to the... the, the um, the whimsical and the humorous in some ways, so that in, in the end the person who raped her, um, who is a sausage by the way, um, which, you know, and she's a peach, um, gets uh, gets his comeuppance and so on. So there's this kind of, the, both this completely in your face, uh, um, you're, you're forced to uh, be submitted to these very visceral, uncomfortable, difficult, bodily details but at the same time there's this sense of whimsy running through it and this sense of magical realism so there's a teacher who's Mr. Custard and he blobs around and you know it, it, it kind of plays with your mm -hmm. with your um, categories of understanding again. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it would be different if sometimes if people had to put themselves in the shoes like so they had to actually imagine going through certain things <laughs> that actually stop them from being willing like so maybe it's a difference between kind of more passive versus active engagement of certain disgusting yeah. things so some things we're, we're willing to passively look but if you said look can you imagine putting yourself into that shoes of doing these certain things maybe people might resist a little bit yeah and it's so interesting you talk about passivity and activity because again going back to Chris Taylor, she, she's re really interested in the abjection precisely as a boundary but also as ambiguous where passivity yeah. and activity isn't quite it's not quite clear when you used the example of vomiting earlier when you vomit you're not really in control of what you're doing no. it's, it's it's done to you rather than you doing it mm. in some way so yeah mm. that boundary again is put in question the idea of disgust being helpful of course if you vomit because you've had something that's poisonous yeah. then of course yeah. this is a very productive yeah. and entirely kind of yeah, yeah. um instinctual response that we have to mm. to um to jettison um yeah. as well at the same time yeah yeah i think david is really interesting when he talks about so he, he writes about um the figure of disgust in, in Kant's the critique and the way that it's the, it's the figure of the indigestible. Yeah. Um, and it's the indigestible in the sense of that which cannot be subsumed within the philosophical system. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of bodily which lies outside and, and constantly troubles it. Yeah. Um, which can't be processed in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess for me that kind of, uh, that's a figure of resistance in some way. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And especially if you go back to the idea of the sublime being this kind of oscillation between repulsion and yeah. um, you know this this awe that you're that you're in awe you're, not, you're in awe of the mountain or the ocean or the mm -hmm. um, the uh, um, volcano or whatever mm -hmm. it is, but at the same time you're you're fascinated by it, and it's in the end for can't of course 
but what kicks in is reason in the end, of course, because he's an arch-rationalist, but there's that moment, and if you read the third critique back into the earlier critiques, there's that moment where the imagination and free play actually upsets all of the, um, the architecture that he's set up and in some way interferes with his system. At least some people would argue that, and I would be one of them, yeah. And I think we see this often with, I mean, the, the idea of excess maybe more so than discussed, but the idea of the ways in which canons of literature or art are produced, so is there a modernist you know, history of art has to jettison, has to consider excessive certain um, forms, certain ways of making work, certain to, uh, overtly figurative or, you know, any one of these examples here has troubled that canon of, of um, kind of modernist rules or strictures of what does and doesn't count as a kind of um, viable work of art, many of which were based on this kind of like sort of Kantian notions. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. so I think it's just kind of interesting that the thing that the, the, thinking of it as a, a figure of resistance is, I think, the most productive way of, of imagining this. The, the thing that troubles, sits on the border um, and troubles mm. those categories. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting way of putting it. I mean, again, if you go back to this sort of idea of, you know, throughout the history of philosophy, this has been this attempt of um, philosophers to argue that somehow matter must be contained by form and if that if if those boundaries are transgressed then we're in serious trouble yeah. um, and you know someone like um, Jacques Vancier is good on this that you know historicizing that moment because of course those moments of um, what what has to be um, what has to be contained is also bound up with all kinds of problematic uh, distinctions between who is allowed to, to have uh, aesthetic taste and who is yeah. not and class mm -hmm. distinctions and race distinctions and gender distinctions play into that so mm -hmm. to problematize that boundary between the, the ways in which the, uh, the, the 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 form the forms that have been considered decent as opposed to those who have yeah. those that which haven't um, that ties mm -hmm. into all kinds of social distinctions that maybe need to be problematized mm -hmm. as well shall we take some questions from the audience I can't help but think during this, I was raised by a dad who was a doctor, and there wasn't anything that wasn't talked about at the dinner table. <laughs> um, at 15, I was a nurse's aide, emptying bedpans, feeding people who couldn't feed themselves, and their food would fall out of their mouth, and I'd have to keep feeding them. There's not, I've done lambing. I've given mouth to mouth to a newborn lamb and seen its heart start to beat. I. There's not, there's not a lot that's disgusting to me beyond human behavior. Donald Trump is disgusting. <laughs> um, and I'm no more drawn to him than... <laughs> but, but, you know, as you were saying early on about the, the, the sort of learned behavior of disgust, there's not a lot, you know, I'm just realizing that there's not a lot in the animal world, there's not a lot in the, in, in the natural world, there's not a lot about the human or any other body or bodily functions that disgust me. And I feel very fortunate. I've never felt so yeah, fortunate. Yeah, 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 it's, it's, it's interesting, because disgust is, seems to be an emotion that people could become desensitized over a long period of time as well. And also, it seems like there's a big range. So people vary in how disgust sensitive they are. So some people are disgusted by a lot of things, and they feel it quite intensely, versus some people are kind of low in disgust sensitivity as well. And it's interesting that you say fortunate, because I, I would say it seems that disgust sensitive, being high in disgust sensitivity can actually be a bad thing because it's um, people who are high in disgust sensitivity, they tend to be um, show more prejudice. They tend to be resistant to eating insects, eating alternative meat. So it's interesting that you use that word. And the people are disgusted. They talk about eating insects is disgusting, but we eat chicken. Um, it, 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 you know, it sort of fascinates me, but if you've ever gone camping and woken up and seeing the poop, the scat of a wild animal next to your tent in the morning and realize that while you were sleeping, all this life was going on. Mm -hmm. The natural world, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah, but bodily functions aren't disgusting. I don't think. Thank you, I think there's another question there. Yes, I wanted to ask about um, disgust and love. So say, for instance, I think about um, a relative dying in a car crash. I don't only feel sad, but I feel really disgusted by the incident. Uh, whereas if I think about my friend's uh, relative who died in a car accident, I don't feel the same way. Or maybe my partner has cheated on me. I feel not only sad and angry, but also disgusted. And maybe the partner has sex with someone else in my bed, and it's even more disgusting. Um, what, is, what is the connection there? Is it just anger taking forms? And I don't know. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Uh, I was just thinking that um, that that f uh, way in which um, you know the, the the question of proximity and the, the question of not actually wanting to touch that which is contaminated um, seems quite important there. Um, uh, and I was also thinking as you were talking about something like David Lynch's Crash, where yeah, there's a kind of fascination or repulsion thing going on again. But maybe that can that that plays a very different uh, role if it's it's. Uh, uh, implicated in someone who, who you love, as you say, um, maybe we don't have that that kind of dis because there's a sense in which being fascinated by things that we're repelled by has to do with a set, as you said earlier, has to do with our ability to take a certain distance from them. But when it's when it actually implicates some someone who we love, we're not able to do that in the same way. So uh, it's interesting because we feel there's some things that we have to get over or discuss. So if we take, for instance bringing up children, we have to change diapers, uh, we have to do lots of disgusting things, so we do seem to get over our disgust for our loved ones. But at the same time, it seems like uh, we feel, we're more likely to feel angry if somebody's closer to us versus if somebody's like a stranger or acquaintance, we're more likely to feel disgust and contempt and emotions like that. So there just seems to be a little interplay of sometimes we have to get over our disgust and versus sometimes it might be more functional to feel an emotion like anger that's tied to kind of more reasoning and thinking like, oh, you know, like you brought up the example of thinking about somebody cheating on you. It might be more the kind of, I'm angry because of, you know, what they actually did, the cheating behavior rather than, and but the disgust might be elicited by the thought of, you know, they had sex in my bed, things like this. Mm -hmm. And it's just more like a visceral response, isn't it? So I was thinking disgust somehow has a certain, now I'm stuck, when you said it in that context, I was thinking, I don't know if I would think of disgust, which has this, does has this kind of tainted by a moral mm -hmm. sense where something more like nausea or a very visceral response to really um, shocking news or something that kind of profoundly kind of affects you, that disgust is one word, but there are other, you know, there's just quite a lot of other kind of words that might work there as well, where it's disgust at behaviour or that something that was done to you um, that kind of it kind of makes more sense in that context, I think. Mm -hmm. But it is, it, I mean, the two are that closely mm -hmm. connected. I think you're right. Thank you. Thank you for those thoughts. Uh, can I ask a question about um, moral or political disgust? Um, it seems to me that um, I think I don't know if you agree that we're seeing more of it now. That people people ex are expressing their views in terms of disgust. Now um, it. Th that seems to me worrying in a number of ways. Um, first of all, if we live in what I would submit is a, a liberal democratic kind of society, and I would see that as, as desirable, then um, we need to listen to each other's views and in the end arrive at some kind of consensus. Um, but if you have discussed, which I'm not saying is wrong because I have discussed, and the lady was talking about Trump, and you know, one has a lot of disgust about different views, but then it might complicate our, our vision of building a consensus. I wondered if you had some thoughts about that. Another aspect of it, which is very relevant to institutions like universities, is this notion of no platforming. Now, students express their strong feelings in the form of a disgust by not wanting to listen to those views or allowing a speaker to speak, and that's problematic for us in, in the kind of liberal democratic theory of society that we um, subscribe to. So it, it seems to me that you know it's perfectly legitimate to have disgust in moral and political views. And you say it's visceral, it might be automatic. To be disgusted by a racist view seems to me correct and legitimate. On the other hand, it raises kinds of problems because we need to be able to, to listen and, and and deal with that, and I'm, I'm confused about that. And I wondered if disgust is part of an interesting way into this problematic that we're all facing. That's so, I mean, just to say, I think that briefly comes back to this idea that disgust might be one word among many others that would that would suffice. And I think that there are many other words that you could also use to describe that kind of um, response to uh, Trump or another situation. But for me, what's key is the there's this what we've been talking about here is that the term disgust shuts things down immediately right that it is just you know that's disgusting take that away I don't want, and and, the, and that's when there isn't a conversation to be had um so I think I would just say that I would agree with this that I think it's a problem if it if it um stops that conversation from happening because someone's reached a limit that is not somehow 
you can't articulate. I mean, if you can't articulate that, then you have a problem, don't you, in terms of having that discussion? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I would have a slightly different response because I, mean, I think it's a really important question at the moment, especially with Brexit going on and Trump, because um, I think, at least certainly for me, um, some of the debate that is going on around Brexit, for example, and Trump, I do find disgusting, and I, think, and I would be prepared to... Uh, defend why I find it disgusting and I'm sure that those people who disagree with me um, would be able to uh, defend why they find what they uh, think is disgusting from a very different point of view <coughs> and I mean I think for me in some sense it's, it's actually really important for those moments to not just occur but then to provoke conversations because I, I do of course agree that it's important that we um, get to the root of why I might find some dis something disgusting and someone else might find something very different disgusting because I think fundamental values are at stake and we need to talk about those uh, fundamental values and while I absolutely agree with you that we need to have um, conversations around those I think that um, you know the, the just the current crisis that this country in, is in at the moment shows that um, people are just completely talking across one another and have completely different affective relationships to questions around colonialism, racism, immigration, on and on and on, poverty, austerity politics, you know. Um, and so those questions are, are, I think, coming to a... a in, in some ways, I think that the, the place we find ourselves in is um, because those conversations haven't happened and they do need to happen. And, now they're happening in a way that's kind of out of control. So, Hi. Um, I thought that there was an, an healthy disgust. I mean, it connected to the, our survival instinct. For example, sorry if I bring this image back again, but when someone is vomiting, that means that has a disease, and disease spreads through air, for example. Or disgust touch, for example, again, disease spreads through touch. So is there a survival instinct that is actually healthy about it? Uh, yes, there seems to be a bit of a pathogen avoidance to discuss. So it's no coincidence that, as you say, vomiting um, is something that people feel disgusted by. And yes, there is very much, you know, if somebody has a vomiting bug, there is disgust to it and it passes pathogens. So I would argue there are some things there that are a little bit functional. Yeah. Hi, sorry, just to bring you back to the previous point, um, I'm just curious to hear your views on, um, or, or what you know, and types of work that have been done on how we can, in a sense, for lack of a better word, reverse engineer disgust. Um, and to what extent, because we obviously talked about works uh, that have prompted um, disgust, which have then prompted a shutdown. So I'm just curious to see to what extent uh, we can actually leverage disgust in a way that could be conducive to reverse engineering that. And also if we look at disgust as a dynamic, so obviously we find things disgusting, but in, in the context of politics we find certain groups of people disgusting or so on. So in that dynamic how we can potentially find ways to uh, reverse that feeling of disgust. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that one one interesting way of thinking about it is um, if uh, people might be disgusted by certain things, um, I don't know, around, um, let's say, trans politics or something like that, but I think that the role of film can play an interesting, um, can do interesting things in terms of um, eliciting people's identification and therefore sympathy um, in a context where um, without that identification, a person might not be um, might be disgusted by certain behaviors um, but actually find themselves despite themselves actually sympathizing with a character in a film that previously they might have found abhorrent in some way so I think I think there are ways in which um, narratives identifications stories books you know can can actually affect um, important political shifts in people's affective economies I've just, just, I mean, I would agree, and I think that the, there's a, there is a distinction between those people for whom the moral and the visceral disgust come together in a desire to shut a work of art down, but really that's, they don't really in, 
trust me or us, right, as much as the actual work that that work is trying to do or is able to do on an audience for whom it might be um, instructive, reparative, you know, revealing in some way in exactly the same kind of way. So I think that, um, um, I think that the, uh, at its best, those kind of works that might elicit disgust um, are doing so in a kind of, um, in a conscious way or in a, in a way that is trying to invite a certain kind of worldview or kind of way of thinking or figuring the world differently um, that hasn't been recognised by people that simply think it is abhorrent in, in some way. So I think that I would hope that at its best those works are able to do that. And if they're not, and if they are simply a kind of a one-liner mm -hmm. or kind of a shock work, but then I'm, I'm not sure that they really um, kind of are as interesting or can sustain our attention for as long. Mm -hmm. So it, I would hope that those works at their best are able to at least begin that work. And it seems from the interpersonal and kind of social realm, you talked about like kind of reversing how we feel about groups. It seems like there's positive emotions that we could elicit that could counteract, can counteract discuss as well. So, for instance, empathy and hu get humanizing with people um, and taking their perspective that can reduce disgust. Also, feeling elevation. So we frequently feel elevation when we've seen some kind of um, morally like superior morally good act that's been found to counteract um, disgust in the context of sexual prejudice, for instance. There are tools. <laughs> There's a question at the back. Hi, thank you. Very good talk. Uh, I could not help not thinking about the temporality of uh, the disgust. It's something that, yes, is different in different cultures, but what if we experience disgust, but then <coughs> we don't feel it anymore? What if we are normalized to the feeling of disgust? I was thinking about the nurses, for example. Uh, that they get used to body excretions, etc., and they don't feel disgust anymore. It's part of their job. And similarly, disgust towards some certain political thoughts, if it's normalized, if, it's, if it becomes a habit, if it's something that we are all slowly exposed to, it doesn't become disgusting anymore. And I think I wanted just to reflect about this temporality of disgust and how it changes over time inside of us um, and how potentially dangerous, if not, that this can be. So, for instance, Paul Rawson, he's argued that there's this process of moralization that happens. So certain things we attach moral significance to, and that changes throughout um, history. So there's lots of examples of you know, people changing their opinions. Like, so, for instance, cigarette smoking or obesity, there are examples of things that have been moralized. And it's important because... Um, these process of moralization, they seem to be strongly tied to feelings of disgust. So it seems like when things are demoralized, that disgust also weakens as well. So it seems that they do go hand in hand together. And yes, you are definitely, it is relevant that it seems to, that there seems to be kind of historical influences in which we could see change happen um, when things become demoralized and we don't strongly feel disgust towards them. Mm -hmm. No, I, would, I would say that you're right, that habituation has a lot to do with it, that mm. the, because the things that we, typically the things that disgust us are things that we um, don't have much to do with and therefore shock us in some way when we do, when we are confronted with them. So that um, that question, but th there's also the other side of it, I suppose, when uh, that, that you're kind of indicating when you talk about the the normalization of, I mean, this, you could go back, go back to the question of Trump. I think, you know, there are things that disgust me about his behaviors, which apparently have become quite normalized and don't disgust other people. So um, that's quite shocking to me. <laughs> yeah, I sometimes wonder with Trump if it's a bit of a moral decoupling that some people are comfortable separating his performance from his moral acts, which is interesting why people are willing to do it for him, but not for all leaders. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Get some questions at the back on that side. Thanks. Um, Whilst you've been talking, I've been trying to take my mind off that um, awful, or you could say wonderful, um, painting of Myra Hindley made out of the prints of um, toddlers. And for those who don't know, um, she um, tortured and murdered with her boyfriend um, several toddlers in the 1970s. Um, to me, I couldn't think of a better word to describe my feelings other than disgust. But not a moral disgust. Nothing I could explain so logically. And not a necessarily a sort of um, more visceral disgust, something else more complicated. And so I'm sort of reminded of the um, limitations of language, perhaps specifically the limitations of the English language in this particular regard. I'm not fluent in any language other than this. 
one, um, although I appreciate that many people in the room are, are bilingual, so they may have something to add to this, as, as may you. But um, is it possible that, um, that, that in the, if, as regards this particular definition, the English language is found lacking? Could we speak about nausea? Which might tie to the idea of nausea as a more kind of existentialist <coughs> or a kind of a, 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 yeah, as opposed yeah, to. Nausea as well, yeah. Yes. Go yes. for nausea? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're definitely limited in the English language. We have less words for discussing different kinds of disgust. Um, so yeah, it's not it's not it's not in your imagination. It is we are limited in the English language in terms of the terms that we use. You, you think it's a limited language in, in respect to these sorts of things? Yeah, so we have less kind of uh, fine grained words for disgust than other languages have. I can't think of any examples at the moment, but there are some languages that have more kinds of words for disgust, and it seems like quite interesting that people don't always have um, a clear understanding of what is moral disgust, which it seems to be coming out a lot today, that we all kind of differ on what we believe is morally disgusting versus not. But it is about a grappling for language as well. So I think in a way we don't have, but this is, you know, this is all we have. This is the frame mm -hmm. in which we need to operate. And that term does seem to come up more. And I think something like the Myra Hindley painting, it elicited quite different, something that went from a kind of nausea to a more kind of a, a morally kind of outrage, you know, it did. It kind of had a more kind of yeah, a more existential response that people would have to this, and, and a more immediate, visceral one that was to do with um, what's right or appropriate and decorum and so on. So I think um, it's kind of an interesting example in that way. But disgust is a kind of a shorthand that does cover quite a lot of mm. different terms. I always often think another word like that is weird. It's something mm. people say when they don't know what else. Mm to say, it was a bit weird. Or normal. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, it's just an inability to kind of find more to say about something that is a bit um, alien in some ways. Yeah, just That's a particularly interesting example, I think, because it, it's um, you know, the, the sort of stereotypical idea of the woman as maternal carer, giver, nurturer, yeah. is, 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 I think, bound, I, I, would, I, would, I would imagine, anyway, is bound up with people's reaction to that particular work of art that um, mm -hmm. maybe it provoked an even stronger reaction than Definitely. if it had been about a ma male murder or something. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that's a very, it's a very charged example. Absolutely, and completely gendered. She's a monster, he was just mad. Mm -hmm. So one is somehow kind of relegated to the mm -hmm. realm of we could never want, you know, mm -hmm. this was just the behaviour of a madman, but there was something truly monstrous about the, the, yeah. the woman who does this, certainly. Yeah, and that idea of yeah. monstrosity, yes. and again, mixing up the categories, because that's not what a woman should do, that's so, right. you know, yeah. somehow it's more morally repugnant than it would be if it yeah. was, wasn't a woman. Yeah. Two more questions at the back, yeah. Uh, really fascinating forum tonight, folks, thank you. Um, I went this morning to see the Bill Viola um, exhibition at the Royal Academy, um, and uh, just before going to the second room, there's a notice there uh, to say the artwork in the next gallery uh, contains graphic scenes that some visitors may find upsetting. And I, I'm kind of familiar with this work, so I was kind of wondering well, which ones might the next room feature, and went in and it's got the Nantes triptych. For those of you who aren't familiar with this work, it's um, on one side of a screen you have uh, a woman giving birth, on the far side of the screen, you have an, a man in the last stages of his life. And I was absolutely fascinated with it, with the really human responses that people had to it. But one of the human responses that I really had difficulty with was people showing disgust um, and passing very, very quickly through, um, through the room, tutting. Um, and I was just kind of wondering more myself, um, but hopefully that you could shed some light on this, kind of what function that avoidance serves in terms of their own disgust about where they came from and where they will actually go to as well. I mean, I think in a way it's a, it's, it's a bit like when we talk about, you know, people might find laugh. I mean, it's just a very strong reaction to something that they're kind of um, <coughs> spending, their, spending their hour life, one's life kind of not kind of looking at head on. Um, I think that you kind of look at things obliquely or you put them to one side like death or you know one's mortality. So I think that in a way um, the warning is kind of uh, 
amazing that they choose to give you a warning of this mm. but I think in a way to be more generous to those people is they're kind of you know they're having kind of this very kind of um this kind of crisis of confrontation with something that perhaps they are not in wanting to or ready to do I mean it's a uh, people react very differently to these things but it is a powerful thing to be confronted with and the kinds of reactions that it might um you know I've just learned a uh, few years of teaching all kinds of visual images that if something is an image that isn't necessarily familiar or something that people were expecting to see, you can get quite a, a, a weird <laughs> range of responses at that first moment, which I think is just somehow, I don't know, recalibrating or, it, you know, it might be a, um, a nervous giggle or it might be kind of, why are they making me think about this or, or look at this? And, um, you know, there's the Don McCullen show up at Tate Britain at the moment, which is his kind of photo documentary now repackaged as fine art kind of um, reportage images this is there you know you will see photographs of dead bodies in some of these rooms and so that was you know watching people come up close to look at these or to kind of look away it was really that was more interesting to me in a way than than the, the photographs themselves with how we're going to deal with this you know here's his photographs from Vietnam or, or you know and so you know that you're about to enter these images um, that you've been uh, told will also contain dead bodies and injured bodies but what was interesting was people were just straight up close and I think this was something about photography that does that but I think they were experiencing just the excessive kind of too much the too muchness of, of that um, maybe I haven't seen the exhibit but it seems to me as well it has to do with the politics of what you expect to see when you go to an art gallery mm -hmm. and you know, the, 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 I mean, going back to Kant, the idea that aesthetics is about uh, art should be beautiful and it shouldn't be disgusting and that's somehow beyond the pale um, and the sort of challenge to that that some, some artists are um, issuing. Um, and so it, in, in a lot of ways, for me, it, it um, goes back to the question of art's respectability and the ways in which um, aesthetics has been heavily classed as well as gendered and braced and that there are certain expectations of what happens when you go to an art gallery and to be confronted with something that one might find disgusting is somehow violating um, one's expectations. Mm. Um, mm. So um, yeah, that sort of uh, idea of people walking by going tut tut is uh, bound up with all kinds of social, socially led responses about what art should be and beauty and um, the, the boundaries of aesthetics and politics in a way. Mm. We've got time for one more question. Okay, uh, I think this is mostly, well, it's for everyone, but especially Sophie Russell. Um, I was wondering what you, your opinion is on uh, Valerie Curtis, among others, um, parasite avoidance theory and how it ties in with, uh, so I think it explains physical disgust very, fairly well but I was wondering your opinion on moral disgust and how it goes to explain that. Um, well, it's kind of argued that for these uh, further function, like kind of moral and social disgust arguments, that it's kind of, a d it's a different function. So for, you mentioned uh, Valerie Curtis, she argues that it's a lot of the kind of the pathogen avoidance. And there seems to be this kind of school of thought that there's um, kind of uh, this pathogen core disgust that serves that function. And then there's kind of the um, this sexual kind of uh, disgust that f functions um, to related to kind of like, uh, you know, wanting to engage in only certain kind of kind of acts and then there seems to kind of be moral disgust which is seems to be the more kind of questionable realm of whether that is true disgust and um, I would probably argue that one of the issues with saying that you know moral disgust is true disgust that it seems to be strongly tied uh, with anger but that seems to be something that's heavily debated in the literature in terms of whether that is true disgust or not but it seems to be um, yes that disgust has this evolved mechanism that kind of goes from the core to the kind of socio-moral aspects. Maybe we can squeeze in one more question. My question is basically to bring it back to the definition of disgust. Could we then say that, broadly speaking, um, the most in one most encompassing definition of disgust would be the like the encounter of the conscience with elements of the subconscious in that sense. So, um, pulsions of or expressions of life and expressions of death, um, and then disgust would be the like the reaction to that encounter i mean it's, it's interesting that um you you bring up the terms the subconscious and that the 
the conscious. One of the things that Christopher is doing with her notion of the abject is arguing against Lacan that maybe the most fundamental division is not the conscious and the unconscious, but in fact the inside and the outside, or the mm -hmm. I and the other. So, um, so yeah, in some sense, she's she's kind of suggesting that there's this this move, this radical exclusion, this kind of uh, impulse to move away from that which disgusts us or that which is abject, which I'm collapsing for a moment, which probably she wouldn't quite do, but. Um, is, is actually more fundamental, is more, vis is more defining of us in some sense than the unconscious conscious. Um, Interesting. Is, is maybe the true aspect of disgust kind of the avoidance or is it kind of the actual physiological like gagging response, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Psychologists would kind of think that there's multiple factors to emotions, so the physiological response, which you say, which you praise, which you behave, and you can have different elements that are either there or not there. We are out of time. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you.